Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Good. Hey, uh, this is a little bit off script, but I wanted to say, man, I love singing with this church. It's loud in here, and that is fun. And I wanted to point out they just left, so I feel bad. I wanted to catch up before they left. But seeing the kids engaged in worship, hands raised and singing, is just good for my soul, and I appreciate that. So uh, maybe this is weird if it's your first time, but I love you. I'm glad that you're here, and I really do like worshiping with you all, all right? And I should introduce myself, especially if it's your first time here. My name is Phil. Um, I'm one of the pastors here. I'm the associate pastor, I should say, at Vintage Church Durham, and we're really glad that you're here with us this morning, and we hope that you feel welcome. Uh, we say this, I think, pretty much every week, but we're one church in multiple locations where we welcome doubters, seekers, and followers of Jesus to come and experience him. And, and you may wonder, what is it that we mean by that? And really what we mean is that no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, no matter what your theological background is, we hope that you feel welcome and received and cared for here. Um, we, I may be getting a little bit ahead of myself, I'm sure, but we believe that the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ, is so deep and lovely and rich that it can simultaneously change the heart of those who doubt him and help uh, bring growth in the life of those who follow him. And so if you have any questions about that or anything that we say or do here, you can fill out a Connect card. You'll find them on the stations on your way out this morning, and myself or another leader will be in touch with you, and we'll get you plugged in here, all right? I've got one really quick reminder and one hopefully quick announcement, and then we're going to get into it. The first reminder is that today is a different flow. It's a truncated worship service. So instead of inviting the band back up here after I'm done uh, with, with my sermon, we're actually going to hold a members meeting. And, and we invite anyone who's a member, a longtime attender, even if it's your first time, you're welcome to stay for that and see kind of how we talk through things and, and, and kind of cast some vision and some planning for what the rest of this year is going to look like. So that'll be actually after I'm done up here. And so I'm, I'm going to try to go shorter. I promise. I'm already up against the clock. <laughs> but um, yeah, come and see, see, see how we do that. The second is an announcement, it's a reminder that Holy Week is coming. Easter is approaching and it maybe feels like it's sneaking up on us because it's a little bit early this year. Uh, so I wanted to remind us first, uh, Good Friday, we'll be here, we'll be worshiping. Um, 7 p.m., I think that Good Friday is March 29th. If anybody's better with their calendar and wants to raise their hand and correct me, please. I'm getting a lot of amens, cool. So March 29th, I should know that, um, <laughs> 7 p.m. And then... Uh, Sunday, we'll celebrate our resurrected Jesus, our living hope, our King of Kings together. And I want to say this about Easter, and then I promise I'll get into the sermon. Uh, it's been my experience. It doesn't have to be true for you, but it's, it's one of, something that I've observed over the years is that Easter and Christmas often can be one of the few times that people come to church and hear the gospel. And so if you've got friends and you've got family in town, would you just bring them with you to either Good Friday, or Easter, or both? I think you'll be glad that you took the chance to bring them in with you. We want to make much of Jesus in this church and reach people who don't know him. And one of the best ways to do that is to invite them to our Easter service. We're going to be as radically hospitable and welcoming and loving as we can for Easter. And so bring people with you. All right? I'm going to pray. Then we're going to get into Luke 5. All right? Let's pray together, church. <clears throat> Lord, we... We come to you this morning really just in complete and utter and desperate need of your goodness and of your grace. We thank you for first loving us despite the way that we're sinful and despite the ways that we're prone to wander from you. God, you never leave us, you never forsake us, and, and I thank you for that. Holy Spirit, would you meet those who doubt this morning right where they are? Would you lead us to your truth and equip us to invite others into this community to experience your goodness and your mercy. Uh, you, turn, you turn mourning into dancing. You bring death to life. You're a friend to sinners. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray and ask all these things. Amen. All right, thank you. Look, I'm going to start off again this morning with a story. I, I guess that's something I'm doing in this year is stories and illustrations. I don't know if they're working or not, but just bear with me for a few minutes as I'm going to tell yet again another story of my life. I hope it's a good one, though. <laughs> um, if you happen to follow Jesus right now, I want you to just take a moment and imagine the person or the people who introduced the faith to you. 
I want you to think about the language that they used or the intentionality of that person, the things that they did with you, how purposeful they were in building relationship with you. Take five seconds, try to get a picture of that person or those people in your mind. You got them? Cool? All right, I'm going to tell you about my person. This guy named Lee. Uh, maybe you've even heard me talk about Lee. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Lee. Uh, he was a young life leader in my area, and Lee was, and I mean this, he was the biggest teddy bear I had ever met. He had the sweetest, most welcoming, crooked smile, and he had one of the most patient hearts that I had ever encountered as a young man. It's because G- Lee, uh, he knew Jesus. He loved Jesus, and in fact, he loved Jesus so much that he would hang out with me and my friends in high school during his free time. And my friends in high school were a group of football players, soccer players, theater kids, uh, kids from the wealthy side of town, and kids from the not-so-wealthy side of town. I don't, um, I don't have teenagers now, and it's been a while since I've been in the schools, but at least for us, that was pretty weird. Like, Wolf hanging out with the lamb kind of stuff. Football players and soccer players being friends? No way. Theater kids and and football kids? Not so much. Uh, (laughs) I've got some people who are there who can attest to how weird that was when we went to high school. But anyways, uh, and I know it it might be a stretch. I get it. To compare that experience to the disciples. It's an illustration. They fall short. I get it. But I I hope you see that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Lee because I'm getting off topic. Uh, What would compel this 20-something-year-old guy, to try and teach the Bible to and disciple obstinate, rude, and even hurtful young men like me and my friends. Well, in his words, uh, he, f- he felt like he could do it because he was like us in so many ways. Because Lee was open about his struggles. He made mistakes, but he was so sure that he was first loved by Jesus that he knew that if he could be changed, well, then maybe we could be too. And so, moving forward a little bit in the story, I remember I was sitting on a big rock at Lake Champion with Lee, and I remember really struggling with some of the stuff he was telling me. I remember somewhat angrily asking him, Lee, why would Jesus love me? I don't follow rules. I don't want to go to church. I'm a jerk. Sam can tell you, I was a jerk when I was 16 years old. I don't think that I belong to this group. I just don't fit in here. And Lee, uh, he, he told me the story of Levi. Matthew, as we come to know him. This Jewish tax collector that was so hated by his peers and yet also called to follow Jesus. And experience fellowship with this ragtag group of disciples and eventually author one of the gospel accounts. My friend Lee invited me to consider a God that that knew and saw the depth of my spiritual unworthiness and still send his son for me, to die for me, to save me, to keep me and to love me no matter what. And in that moment, I began to think, oh, maybe this stuff is actually real. And I'm a doer by nature, and so I remember asking him, if I start to believe this stuff is real, what what do I do with that? What do I do now? And he said, we go out. We show people what Jesus is like. We tell people about it. We invite others into what we've experienced. Follow-up question, what if I don't know what what to say, what to do? What if I'm still pretty much a work in progress? I'm a messy person. Well, Lee reminded me he was a messy guy too. But he couldn't help but let people know that Jesus loved them. He he trusted Jesus to clean up the mess along the way. Actually, maybe I would say it this way. He knew that Jesus would use the mess for good. He helped me to see that in our weakness and in our mess is where we would see Jesus most lovely and powerful. Lee was, uh, he was a big brother to me. I loved Lee. Uh, He came to my house in the middle of the night when things weren't going so well with my dad who was cancer. Uh, He went to my football games and he cheered louder than pretty much everyone except Heather and my mom. And... (laughs) He helped me actually have courage to talk to a girl at that rock that very same week who I now have three kids with and have been with for the last 16 years. And for reasons um, I don't understand, Lee got pancreatic cancer. He died a few years ago. But I am sure 
that when he passed, he heard the words we all long to hear. Well done, my good and my faithful servant. Because from that group of weirdos at a high school camp, there's two pastors, a missionary married to another missionary, and several families that are married and have kids and attend church. All because one man decided Jesus was real enough to invite others to meet him. Now I recognize my story, my experience is not authoritative. But it is representative of some of the truth that we encounter in the Bible. And so today I want to look more closely at that man, Levi. Matthew as we know him. And he's this tax collector, like I said. He's like Peter from last week. He's just trying to do his job. And he comes off as pretty unlikely to hear the Messiah say, why don't you come follow me? So this morning I want to continue our series looking at Jesus and people in Luke chapter 5. And I want to center our focus on what we talk about as our lived amen for this year, our goal for the year, which is to see the surpassing worth of Jesus and respond the only way that we really can, by offering our lives as living sacrifices. We're going to look at people, and we're going to look at uh, how they experienced Jesus and how they responded. And so today, I'm going to make just one point, and it's this. We respond to an encounter with Jesus by following him and inviting others to experience and to know him. More simply put, we want people to know the one who came to save sinners. All right? And and I think because of who we are as a church, we're going to see that that goodness is not just for the followers in the room today, but I hope that you hear, if you're a doubter or a seeker, that, that, that you're not too far out of the reach of Jesus. You're not too far from the love of God, and I'm hoping that we'll see that in today's passage, all right? I'm going to reread it, we're going to break it down to chunks, and I hope you see the goodness of God, okay? It says this, after this, uh, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And so leaving everything behind, he got up and he began to follow him. Then Levi, he hosted a grand banquet for him at his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining at the table with them. But when the Pharisees and their scribes, they were complaining to his disciples, why do you eat and why do you drink with these tax collectors and these sinners? Jesus replied to them, it's not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. A little bit of context leading up to this passage, we've seen Jesus heal someone oppressed by a demon, a leper and a paralytic. We see Jesus' earthly ministry time and time again as one of action. He liberates people who are suffering from evil spirits, physical handicaps. He breaks down the barriers of social unworthiness. And as is the case really with any good story, there's an antagonist. Those are the Pharisees. These knowers, these teachers of the law, they're around Jesus' work. They're proximate to it, but they protest it. But Jesus performed these things to demonstrate, as it says just a little bit before our passage, the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Forgiveness and healing, they're linked to one another in a sense. It's like saying, if he could do one, well, he surely can do the other. I point that out because it's a fun little truth nugget that helps us think about the last couple verses of today's passage. Um, But yeah, so in the immediate context of calling of Matthew, there's healings, there's the demonstration that the Son of Man, Jesus, he has complete and total authority to be doing what he's doing. It's one way that in Luke's gospel we see Jesus' messiahship made most clear. You have to remember that the Jewish people believed that, that all of their history, all of their life, it culminated in the coming of this Messiah that would free them from their oppressors, which are the Romans in this context. He would set things right, he would restore Israel, and he would rule and he would reign forever. And we're beginning to see in Luke's gospel account that Jesus is that Messiah. The Pharisees are struggling to see it, but those who are closest to him are beginning to experience it and believe it. They glorify God and they're filled with awe. And now it says, after all that, Jesus went out And he saw the tax collector named Levi. I'm going to refer to him as Matthew from now on. And he saw him at the booth and he said, follow me. Uh, Up to this point, I'd imagine that the disciples are pretty much on board with what's going on, for the most part. Fishermen, zealots, people from different backgrounds, they're experiencing and they're learning from the one that they're beginning to believe is their Messiah. Sign me up for that, no problem. 
But if you'll allow me to have just a little bit of creative freedom to hop out of the text for a moment, I think it would be important to consider the calling of Matthew from somebody like Peter's perspective. I already said this, Matthew's a Jewish man, but the Jewish people, they're occupied. They're occupied by the Romans, and I don't think they had a lot of love in their heart for somebody with uh, Matthew's vocation. These tax collectors would have been deeply, deeply hated. They're crooked, self-serving, unpopular representatives of the Romans and their tax code. I think he's treated as a religious outcast. He's a collaborator that would have extorted his own people. Matthew's choices would have led him to a large, uh, steady, and stable income. And, and I would point this out. Uh, he, his income, it didn't re- rely upon the weather, fish migration patterns, or manual labor. He's decidedly different than somebody like Peter. So to Peter, I think Matthew's just kind of the worst. <laughs> He's a traitor. He sold out his Jewish brothers and sisters for just a little extra coin. And now... The person you've been following, the Messiah, looks at Matthew and says, join us. Follow me. If I'm Peter, I'm not too happy about that. Jesus, I'm on board with these other guys. That's a step too far. This person has hurt us too much. He's he's not welcome here. I get what you're trying to say. Peter's the line. And I think you've crossed it. Now, again, that's my imagination. It doesn't say that. I want to make that clear. But that's how I would feel, at least, in that setting. But, but I, and actually, for what it's worth, the Pharisees react that way in a couple of verses. But I think in calling Matthew, Jesus is demonstrating a few things to us. I want to point them out. First, we don't decide who Jesus calls to follow him. Uh, Second, I would say that his love, it it, it reaches across time, space, race, culture, social status. All varieties of human brokenness are touched by the love of Jesus. There is no corner of the earth. There is no sin too great that Jesus cannot overcome it. And I would say this as well. Followers of Jesus learn to get comfortable with being uncomfortable with the makeup of his disciples. Followers of Jesus leave behind divisions of this world and unite under his lordship. Not perfectly, but with a desire to see that hostility, the wall of hostility torn down, right? In fact, I'll say this, uh, I think we believe that so deeply at Vintage that we've updated some of our language. We've updated our DNA as a church. Uh, I don't remember what it used to say. I should have. But this is what it does say now in one of our DNA points. We are building a healthy, multi-ethnic church. We will know, we will live, and we will advance the gospel together, bearing credible witness to Jesus as a community in which people of varying ethnic and economic backgrounds are unified beyond the distinctions and the divisions of this world. Jesus is doing that in this passage. It's continued work through the church today. I think he's also communicating, in one sense, that sin levels that spiritual playing field for us. What I or the Pharisees may have neglected to see, is that yes, Matthew's sin is public and it's terrible, but so is mine. I'm not any better or any worse. I'm not any more or less worthy of Jesus' love because I don't sin like Matthew. I just sin differently. Jesus extends his love because of grace. Grace simply means that we are all spiritually unworthy, and yet we receive the invitation to follow Jesus. It's not based on our own merits. The last time I was up here, I talked about my favorite passage in all of the New Testament, Ephesians 2. The key words there are grace, not works. Why? You can't boast in your salvation. You didn't earn it. It's given to you. It's gifted to you. The gift in this story, it's extended to people from all walks of life, including Matthew who has been deemed by his peers unworthy of any sort of love and compassion because of the ways that he hurt them. Now look, I understand that there's some complexity in that topic. Sins and varieties of sins have different impacts on humans. I'm aware of that. In this passage specifically, we see that corrupt economic practices would have no doubt impacted the people who lived on the margins of that society. I'm not glossing over that. However, Matthew, or 
Jesus, excuse me, later on in Luke's gospel, does address this concept in a parable. He's talking to another Pharisee about a woman that the Pharisee thinks isn't even worthy to be in their presence. Jesus simply states this. A creditor has two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50, and here are the key words here. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. Forgiveness is available to any who owe any amount of debt, great or small, Jesus invites you to come. Forgiveness is for those who are in desperate need of debt forgiveness, and when you experience that, the love of Jesus is too powerful, I would say, to let all your divisions exist forever. Jesus says that Matthew is welcome to follow me here, even if Phil or Peter decided he's not. And I want to pause for just a moment and encourage us to reflect, just as a church, for a minute. In what ways do we put distinctions and divisions on people that Jesus does not? How do we react to a banquet, let's say, of sinners um, like the Pharisees? I'm not going to ask for answers, and I'm not going to dive into it more deeply. I just want us to think about it because I'm running out of time. <laughs> I, I, I want to turn my attention first to doubters and seekers and then to followers and then we'll be done. For anyone who doubts all of this this morning, if you feel unworthy, if you feel unlovable, if you feel too far gone this morning, all I really want you to hear is that you're not. The Jesus that we believe in invites you in and he says to you, come and experience all that I have for you. Maybe you're someone who identifies with the depth of, of Matthew's sin and choices. There's no doubt a variety of thoughts going through your head. I'm sure they were going through his too. What am I do about my job? Where's this guy going to lead me? Will I ever get back to my booth? Similar doubts and fears are, are, are present in anyone who is prompted by the Spirit to follow Jesus. There's no doubt a cost to following Jesus. All normative and historic Christian practice and experience is not health, wealth, and prosperity. If you came here to hear that, sorry, that's not true. Instead, what happens is you follow Jesus into hard places. And you're equipped by his spirit to love people well for his glory and for their good. His perfect love and grace, it casts out fear so that people like Matthew could just leave it behind and follow their Messiah. In the love that Jesus has for you, I'm sure of this, there's a joy that you likely haven't experienced because it's eternal. There's a safety and there's a security that you're not aware of entirely because it is eternal. He calls us to come. He says as much. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am lowly and I am humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. For those who doubt that this morning, hear that first and also know that the, the goodness of the gospel doesn't just communicate that this Messiah healed people on earth and preached good sermons. He was nailed to and hung on a cross to die. For your sin for my sin, for the sins of mankind, so that we could be reconciled to him. So that hated, sinful extortionists like Matthew could still follow their Messiah and be redeemed eternally, kept secure forever, and welcome to dine with Jesus in his community. We call that the church now. So don't miss me saying this. Jesus sees you, he knows you, and he loves you in your sin, and he makes abundantly clear that you're never too far away from his grasp, that he can't like take a hold of you and change you. Jesus has the ultimate authority and power over sin. Ultimate. Therefore, you can't out -sin the grace of God. We say it this way often, um, and I think it bears repeating, honestly, because I need to remember this. There is absolutely nothing that you could do or that you could say to make God love you any more or any less 
then you are right here, right now. No matter how you feel, or I would say this, no matter how other people may make you feel, maybe in this space or in other church communities, Jesus says, come. I'm going to help them love you. I'm going to help them welcome you. Rest, care, community, security, they're available to any who doubt in the name of Jesus. All that's required of you is that you accept the invitation and follow and watch them change you for the good. I think when you're caught in Jesus' love, you just don't stay the same. Your gifted repentance, your gifted forgiveness, and your life just changes. Eternal life is yours. It's secure. I can't say that enough. So if you have questions about that, or you doubt that this morning, or you have just input, let us know. Please don't leave this morning or go about your week without touching base with somebody here about it, all right? I'll close this kind of thought with this. I thought it was a good quote, so I put it in. It was from a commentator. He describes the church this way. The church is the only fellowship in the world where the only requirement for membership is the unworthiness of the candidate. That's our spiritual unworthiness, redeemed by the total perfect worthiness of Jesus Christ. We want you to be here for as long as it takes for you to understand that and experience it, all right? And for those who have, I'm going to turn to followers as I close with this. If you have experienced that and you have believed that, will you remember that you were invited by the kindness and the goodness of Jesus to come? For Matthew, the result was that he dropped his things, followed Jesus, and then what did he do? He invited others into that. He invited so many that it says it was a large company of tax collectors, otherwise known as sinners. And they celebrated Jesus together. What we can essentially have is a discussion of evangelism here. It's a main point of focus for us this year as a church, and I think we saw it last week, and I think we'll see it this week, that if you're invited by Jesus and you experience him, it will prompt you to bring others in. Matthew responded, he dropped everything, he followed his Messiah, he invited his friends, were fellow sinners, to just come and see the one who was sent to save sinners. Been in church Durham, I hope we would strive to the same end. And we do so out of the love that he has for us. I'll say it this way, if we want to love Durham well, or love one, as we like to say at Vintage, if we want to love our lost family members and coworkers and friends, one of the most loving things we could do for them is invite them to experience and see Jesus. Paul, in a letter to the Romans, reminds us that people are perishing apart from the truth of Jesus. And I know that that's heavy. But I think it's a good reminder for the church to remember that and to remember this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he asks this series of questions. How can they call on him who they have not believed in? How can they believe without hearing about him? How can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? The answer is evangelism. It's invitation. It's welcoming lost people into our community as a deep act of love and compassion. I know that it's awkward. Trust me, I get shot down more than people accept the invitation for what it's worth. I I, I understand that it's awkward. And I really hope, uh, this is just how my brain works, so hear this with love. (laughs) Um, If Jesus hung on the cross and did all that he did for us, I don't think he's asking too much of us to share the gospel with lost people. I don't think it's too much to do it as often as we possibly can. Not perfectly, but at least with like earnest and honest effort. We share because we love lost people. We love them so much that we want them to obtain what we've experienced in Jesus. We, we, we like do it like Philip in John's gospel, who says to Nathaniel, man, would you just come and see Jesus and watch him work? You're going to see greater things, Jesus said. I'm going to close with this challenge to our church, myself included, to share the gospel. If you feel excited by what is going on in this place and in your community groups and what's going on in your life, invite people into that. Take the chance. I'm sure that you'll be glad that you did. 
And also remember this, that Jesus didn't call us into this place because we were righteous or perfectly gifted. He called us because we needed him, and we still do. I don't have time to unpack all that, but we're going to do this based on what he supplies us with. You could look at 1 Peter for more on that if you'd like. Extending that invitation also is not to communicate that people are projects or that you are an evangelistic taskmaster. That's certainly not my intent as well. I simply believe that we ought to do this as part of the natural worship, the natural rhythm in life of the church. It's part of our lifestyle. It's not a project. C.S. Lewis described the church this way one time. He said, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men and women into Christ. If you're not doing that, all the cathedrals, the clergy, the mission, the sermons, it's a waste of time because God became man for no other purpose. My hope today is that you would see the humanity of these biblical characters and know that doubters, seekers, and followers, you're able to identify with them as desperate, sinful, searching, and broken people, but it brings into focus the glory and the goodness of Jesus' intervention in your life. Remember that you were invited. Remember that Jesus is completely worthy of your life. You have experienced the love of Jesus, and may you be convicted this morning, we be convicted this morning by the word of God, to decide that Jesus is real enough to invite others into the banquet. All right? Let's pray. Lord, would you stir us up to love and to good works that includes serving others and loving each other well and boldly inviting lost people into fellowship. Jesus, you came to save sinners. Would you give us hearts like yours to love them and to take risks? And as we close this time in your word, may we just be able to see you and to feel your leading clearly. Lord, as we transition now to talk about the state of the church and cast some vision for the rest of the year. Would you help us as your word says to remember that unless you build the house, we labor in vain. You love this church more than we ever could. Would you give us wisdom? Would you give us clarity to run the race that is set before us together? We pray and ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.